Many African nations are struggling with the rising cost of living, high taxation and ballooning levels of debt. And it might just get worse before it gets better. Now often the IMF does step in to help governments on invitation. Sometimes these interventions work, other times the outcomes aren't quite clear-cut. So a debate has raged and it continues to on the demerits and the merits of the IMF's role in fixing struggling African economies. Well, this week on the program, we'll ask just how do IMF interventions work and what reforms should the fund consider to make the outcomes of its engagement with African economies more mutually beneficial. I'm Uche Okoronkwa. Welcome to Talk Africa. Africa is hard hit and its economies are currently struggling. But government spending and also tax policies are put in place to improve economic conditions and of course people's livelihoods have been met with resistance in some countries. Well, before we begin our discussion, my colleague Robin Nagila now takes a look at the prevailing economic situation across the continent. Sylvanus Edouard is a grocer in Nairobi. His weakness to sharp drop in his income over the past year due to the harder economic times. Since morning, I've only sold $14 worth of produce. By this time last year, I would have sold $100 worth. He says that nowadays, most of his regular customers are very careful with their spending. For many customers, when you tell them the price of a product, they say leave it. So a lot of produce ends up rotting and we throw it away. New additional taxes and a recent increase in old taxes have forced the majority of Kenyans to change their spending habits. The government says the additional taxes are needed to allow the country to service its debts. Kenya is spending 60% of the tax it collects on servicing its debts. A debate is raging in Kenya of a renewed tax regime introduced by the government. At the heart of this debate is a fundamental question. Can you tax a people to prosperity? The short answer is no. Nikhil Hira, a tax expert in Kenya, says the increase in taxes is in line with an IMF program that Kenya signed up to to avoid debt distress and access new financing. They come in when the country requests them to come in. Uh, and it's invariably a country that has uh, uh, got high debt, uh, deficits in their budget uh, that are sort of widening. Across sub-Saharan Africa, several countries are grappling with huge debts and a high cost of living. In Ghana, protesters have taken to the streets of the capital, demanding the resignation of the central bank governor over the high cost of living. There's also been protests in South Africa and Nigeria this year over the rising cost of living. But the IMF is calling for caution as it remains concerned about the potential harm that a sharp increase in taxes could have on African economies. We're having such a marked effect on consumption, uh, disposable incomes and the economy as a whole that uh, we're go it's going to be counterproductive. We're not going to raise taxes, they're actually going to go down. With access to funding limited and available finance offered at high interest rates, most governments now see taxation as the main way of raising funds to meet their debt obligations. That debt is a, is a sovereign debt, meaning that the government cannot afford to default on that debt. So it must do everything within its power to pay off that debt. Unfortunately, uh, paying off that debt means other aspects of spending will be crowded out, like uh, recurrent expenditure and development. Back at his grocery business in Nairobi, Sylvanus Sudmore says he may need a second job just to be able to stay afloat. If things carry on like this, I will have to look for something else to sustain myself. For many like him, these are desperate times that sometimes call for desperate measures. Robert Nagila, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya.
Well, joining us now to delve further into that discussion is Dr. Remy Piet. He's joining us in Sydney. He is a senior partner at Embeli Advisory. And from Accra, Dr. Adu Owusu Sakodi. He's an economics lecturer at the University of Ghana. And of course, with me here in the studio is Dr. or rather Professor Fadel Kaboub, who of course uh, is a, the president of the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity and of course also a professor of economics at Denison university welcome to all of you gentlemen looking forward to a great discussion today and i'd like to start off uh, with you dr piet what is your take on some of those criticisms that the ims imf is currently facing uh, for example they say tough conditions come with their programs they also say the uh, the cost of lending is quite high uh, what's your take on what people say I mean, there's a different, a large range of, of different in criticism on, on the IMF and other Bretton Woods institutions, especially the lack of representation of developed nations, including Africa, and, and as we were saying, a series of, of conditionalities and, and, and sometimes, you know, a high level of interest rate. But if you're actually taking into into a larger consideration, uh, the, the loans from the IMF are usually at much lower rates than some that might be achieved from commercial banks or other lenders on the international market. And so therefore, you know, the IMF is a lender of last resort, but still as at a high you know, interest rate compared to what would be the desires of, of, of uh, countries that, you know, appeal on, on the support from the IMF. The lack of representation from Africa is actually the the, the, the results of, of historical conditions. I mean, the, the IMF and the World Bank were built in 1946 as part of the Bretton Woods institutions at a time where African countries were unfortunately not independent yet and therefore did not have a voice in terms of, of being able to uh, to build those those uh, uh, you know institutions. And when you look at conditionalities, I mean, the, the, the questions here and, and demands from the IMF are really to make sure that countries that, you know, you know, pull out a loan from the IMF are able to reimburse that loan. And according to the IMF, the objective is to make sure that you have some macroeconomic, you know, conditions such as a balanced uh, budget or, or reduced, uh, you know, vulnerabilities to external factors uh, that will actually allow for, you know, different countries to reimburse the loan. However, the IMF doesn't go into details as to, you know, which you know, conditions and measures should be adopted by countries in terms to reduce their, let's say, budget deficit. And it is each country that decides whether or not to, you know, make tax cuts or to reduce budgets of defense or education or other elements. That's quite interesting. And Dr. Sarkodi, do you, why do you think then that we have this growing sentiment that the IMF has not sufficiently uh, helped to tackle some of the economic crisis, that uh, they're rather adding turmoil and more pain to the people on the ground? Um, Ghana has been to the IMF, for example, for uh, 17 times, and in each of the time that we go there, they give us what we call the macro, uh, the balance of payment support. And the balance of payment support is to restore macroeconomic stability. And again, most of the reforms uh, uh, must be done by the country itself. So um, the, the IMF as a body, you know, Ghana is a member, and sure, so many African countries are members. The IMF has given this uh, two years, and within two years, they have given $50 billion uh, to about 21 African countries. And, and as if it was enough for these countries to develop, they will just give the stability. And what you do with the stability is up to you. So it is incumbent on African economies to have our own policies, to have our own grown uh, solutions to our problems. Uh, in, in terms of revenue generation, the IMF will not tell you uh, which areas specifically you must generate. In fact, in, in, before the 1990s, uh, the IMF were, you know, very strong on their conditionalities, in dictating the pay, dictating to African countries on what to do. But uh, after 1990s, they have changed their models, their models of operandi. They have changed the way they do things. They only recommend that the current IMF program we have, they have asked the government of Ghana to adjust the utility tariffs upwards and, and if you listen to the government officials, there were things that they needed to do, even without an IMF program, except that they didn't have the political will to, you know, increase the utility tariffs, but they were hiding behind the IMF program to increase the utility tariffs. So what is my biggest criticism is how Africans can leverage their natural resources to transform their economies. Most countries in the world have transformed their economies using their natural resource. Thank you for that, uh, Doctor. But Professor, it's interesting because we've actually discussed uh, in the past about the sort of turmoil that the IMF program caused in a country like Tunisia. 
So how would you characterize uh, that relationship between the IMF and African, uh, African countries and governments today? Well, as it, as it was uh, stated earlier, the IMF and the World Bank, the Bretton Woods institutions, were created during colonial times. So they were created as colonial institutions by colonial powers. Right. So a, a financial architecture, a global financial architecture, and then the trade and investment architecture that subsequently was developed under the GATT agreements and the WTO, the entire framework in which we operate was built not by us, not for us, so it can't be the system that will deliver equitable results for us. Mm -hmm. So I'm not surprised to see these results. Uh, somebody the other day asked me a similar question. They said, you know, the World Bank and the IMF, you know, they've, they've been operating in the Global South for decades and the results are a debt trap. So how do you explain that? And it just occurred to me, it's one of two things. It's either incompetence or intentional entrapment. Mm -hmm. It can't be anything else. Mm -hmm. Now, if the IMF came to a country in debt distress today and said, we will step in and help you out in the next year or two to get you out of this crisis. But here are the conditionalities that we want you to do. We want you to invest in domestic wheat and corn production. We want you to invest in domestic renewable energy production. We want you to invest in industrial policies that allow you to escape the you know, the model of exporting raw materials. And we will provide you with partnerships and assistance and, and all that. They never do that. If anything, all the suggestions and recommendations and imposed policies sometimes that they force on countries are actually designed to lock you deeper into that position. Mm -hmm. And that's why I keep saying they're still colonial institutions. All right. And that's the, the uh, uh, Professor Kaboob does raise quite uh, interesting points there. And Dr. Piet, I want to ask you then, what, it, what is your take uh, on some of the things he said? What are your views on why African nations are seemingly trapped in this uh, debt cycle today? Whose shoulder should the blame lie? Do you think some of it does lie with the global financial architecture? I somewhat agree with what was said, but at the same time, we should not overstate the power of the IMF. And first of all, the IMF doesn't step in into a country without the request from the government itself. So meaning that it's the national government that requests from the presence of the IMF because and that because there's obviously a, a, a series of different monetary issues or, or budget issues and the IMF down the road is, is a more you know let's say more generous or at least you know le least uh, amount of interest rate than other lenders on, on the market so it's not that if the IMF steps into a country and decides that this will be this will be the conditions however large a lot of the of the reasons why you know uh, developing nations were not able to uh, to to develop by themselves is also you know some you know domestic factors uh, some decision made by you know governments to you know potentially favor uh budgetary spendings that could be on on on, on defense or, or other elements more than education or more than you know other long-term investment into their population and obviously there's the element of corruption which is also very important mm -hmm. Uh, a, a lot of, of unfortunately, uh, developing nations have been suffering from from corruptions of their of their elites of their rulers, and that actually have evaded. And it's not only the case of Africa, by the way. It's also of many other countries, and corruption also exists in, in very much industrialized countries. I'm not making uh, the assumption that it will only be in African countries, but that has been, you know, one of the key factors of the limited capacities of of of, uh, of African countries to move forward and be able to, you know, not fall into that debt trap. But the objective from the IMF or the World Bank and the Bretton Woods Institution is actually to try to help alleviate poverty, not reinforce colonization. That's where I probably have, you know, a, a, a disagreement. But they're limited. Uh, there are only, you know, uh, financial actors that can actually provide some recommendation in terms of policy. Then the implementation depends on the countries themselves. And we've seen, unfortunately, a series of countries and leaders not being able to break with the corruption cycle or take into consideration long term visions for the population themselves. Mm. You're quite right, Dr. Piet, and I'd like to ask you, Dr. Sarkodi, on whose shoulders, or rather, shouldn't uh, the blame lie on African uh, leaders? Uh, because they're the ones who uh, determine, go to the IMF, they're the ones who uh, support their economies through this crisis, they're the ones behind uh, this debt cycle. And with this uh, debt cycle that uh, African leaders have to deal with uh, today, what is the alternative uh, for them? It, in, 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 as opposed to going to the IMF or the World Bank for more funding? I think I understand the concerns around the global financial architecture and the fact that the IMF and the World Bank should provide some funding on concessional basis uh, to help African economies. But it's also true 
that a, a greater part of the blame should be resting on the shoulders of the African leaders. Because as I have stated, when you are in crisis, when you are in difficulties, you run to the IMF for balance of payment support. And, and Ghana has been there for 17 times and each of the occasions it was necessary because our, our macroeconomic was so unstable but that we needed that balance of payment support from the IMF. But after they have provided with you with this support, they leave. They leave your country. And what you do with the stability is always up to you. And my brother also mentioned that IMF doesn't impose themselves on countries. It's the countries who go to them to seek help. So a greater part of the responsibility should be on us. I am preaching the ownership of our destiny. We should own our destiny, own our resources, own our policies, own our development strategies, own our industrialization, because other countries have shown us the way we cannot sit down and wait for the IMF and the World Bank to come and take us out of all the crises that we, we, we find ourselves. They will not talk about equity reduction. They are not interested in inequality reduction. They are not interested in so many things. All they are interested in is to give you the support. What you do with the support is up to you. Mm. And the time is now for us to take actions and own our destiny, own our resources, and own the development of our own countries. Mm. And Professor, I'm curious to you know, why do you think then there's all this um, criticism and grumbling around these IMF programs? And, and looking closer at these programs uh, and the track record so far, what's your take on the success of the, the funds programs? Well, Tunisia is a good example to, to contrast what's, uh, what we're discussing here because Tunisia has been asking for IMF uh, loans now for a number of years. And the agreement has been uh, stalled uh, several times because the IMF didn't like Tunisia's proposed budget reforms, proposed spending plans. So they say, no, we're not going to give you the money. So it's true. Once they give you the money, it's already pre-agreed upon what you will do with it and how you will manage it, how much you will increase food prices, mm -hmm. how much you will reduce subsidies on fuel, on food, uh, how much you will allocate to certain expenditures. And the tricky part about the IMF approval, you know, to get the stamp of approval, even though it's the lender of last resort, once you have that, then you can go to international capital markets and actually borrow from private investors. But without an IMF deal, you can't even have access to any external financing other than with friendly nations who decide to step in, like Saudi Arabia, like Qatar, like others. And everybody, anybody who's going to lend you money is going to have some vested interest in one way or another. But we have to recognize that the colonial structures continued day one after independence because all of our charismatic independent lead, independence leaders on day one when they became president or prime minister, you can't completely undo the colonial economic structure. So what do you do to let your economy continue to function? You dig the same mines, you ship on the same railroads to the same ports that were built by colonial to the same customers in the global north. And that becomes an institutional structure that continues to this day. Take strategic minerals, for example, what they call critical minerals, which are critical for the high-tech industry of the 21st century, for the renewable ener energy of the 21st century, for decarbonizing the world. All of those strategic minerals are either in Africa or in Latin America, in the global south. And what do we do? We extract them and we sell them as raw materials. Then we beg to import the solar panels and wind turbines, and we pay a premium to import all the high-tech uh, that we need on this continent. Instead of saying, we at the Pan-African level, we're going to use our collective resources, natural resources, mm -hmm. and we're going to design a Pan-African industrial policy to manufacture renewable energy infrastructure to deploy on this continent. Mm -hmm. But instead, what do we do? We get the foreign investment to produce green electricity on this continent, not for us, the majority of it is for export. That's the continuation of the extractive industry from the global north to this day. Right. So yes, we do have a responsibility to have that conversation to transform mm -hmm. our economies. Do, uh, prof the professor does raise a great point, is the fact that there is a global financial system uh, in place. And we'll get into all of this, but uh, we're having a very interesting discussion right now, gentlemen, but we're going to take a short break. Uh, when we come back, we'll take a closer look at those possible reforms that could take place in the global financial, uh, in global financial institutions to change the status quo. Do stay with us.
Welcome back to Talk Africa, and still with me on the show are Dr. Remy Piet, Dr. Adu Owosu Sarkodi, and of course, Professor Fadel Kaboub joining me here in the studio. Now, before we went to break, uh, you raised uh, the professor raised a great point. He said, uh, we cannot ignore that the global financial systems have existed for many years and for a long time not in favor of Africa's uh, economy. So, Dr. Piet, I want to go to uh, to you next. What is your take on the response we've seen so far uh, from global financial institutions when we talk about reforming the system in a way that benefits developing nations and, of course, poor nations as well? So we, we talked about m many different issues, and, and sometimes we, we should maybe differentiate what we're talking about here. I mean, obviously, the IMF is a financial actor that actually demands for conditionalities from national budgets, making sure that you know some counterproductive subsidies, maybe on, on, on energy, for example, do not limit the capacity of, of states to reimburse the loans. I mean, even if they are at a lower interest rate that that market rates. But there's indeed one one key element that that you know both my colleagues mentioned, which is the incapacity of African countries to work together to arrive to you know size and capacities of market that would encourage investments inside Africa, for example, or would manage or facilitate the creation of value in Africa. There are some good examples, especially in natural, you know, reserve, uh, sorry, on, on, uh, natural minerals, in critical minerals, for example, the case of Zambia with Congo and Tanzania, talking about potentially working on lithium production and, 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 and transformation in Africa. But this has been very, very limited. In terms of purely financial infrastructure, if we go back to this, the IMF doesn't demand specific, you know, uh, policies. They do give recommendations they do demand a limitation of, of budget deficit, for example, but it is the capacities of national of, of each country to decide where to make the cuts. And unfortunately, we've seen over the last decades that some of the cuts were made on education. They were made on the health sector. They were not made on the defense sector, for example, that might have been, you know, uh, for, for, for different domestic reasons. And that has led to, you know, sometimes, you know, African countries, it has contributed to the fact that African countries fell into the debt trap, but they would have fallen in the same debt trap, whether it was the IMF providing a loan or it was, you know, private uh, banks. Uh, the only reason why the IMF is actually, you know, being called upon by African countries is because the interest rate is usually lower. And unfortunately, some countries, whether it's Tunisia or others, do not like the request that some of those subsidies should be cut because they're counterproductive for the national economy. But that might actually answer some populistic interest of the governments of the governments in place uh, towards the population that just want to be re-elected or want to don't have the long-term vision that need to be done for their economies to move forward mm. and dr sarkodi uh, i'd like to get your take because we talk a lot about the uh, the rising or growing importance of the global south uh, going forward but where does africa really stand uh, especially uh, when we talk about the economic realities the growing uh, tensions uh, on the global in the global economy growing rather geopolitical tensions and also the resulting fragmentation that we're seeing in the global economy. Where does Africa stand in terms of its voice? Well, uh, Africa doesn't seem to have uh, a louder voice uh, in terms of the global economy, uh, but but there have been some, some reforms, there have been some progress um, that we need to leverage on the, the currently the WTO head of uh, the head of WTO is a Nigerian uh, we had Ghanaian heading the UN. We had some African, you know, some Africans heading prominent international organizations. And I think we should leverage, we should take advantage of all these things. But unfortunately, we don't have so much power. We don't have so much uh, voice in, in, in the global economy. Uh, again, the points have been made. The dependency theory is now more pronounced because everything done uh, on, on the global stage is to perpetuate Africa's dependence on, on, on these um, uh, advanced economies. And that's something we must get out of uh, in terms of the architecture. And then we can come within and have our own programs and all policies to, uh, to, to get out of this. You, look, you mentioned trade. 
between African economies uh, as a percentage of the global trade, it is very negligible. And, and some of these things must be uh, resolved and be reformed so that we can have a better you know, place in the global economy. Mm. And Professor, I'd like to ask you, looking at the geopolitics of it all, uh, the reality is things are changing. Uh, we're seeing alternatives such as BRICS uh, coming up. So what is your take on the emergence of uh, groups like the BRICS, uh, the expansion of BRICS as well, uh, the establishment of an alternative financier like the New Development Bank, and also proposals that we're seeing about alternative uh, currencies to the dollar, for example? Sure. Oh, well, the, I've, I've said it before, you can't de-dollarize a system that hasn't been decolonized structurally yet. So yes, it's a welcome introduction to, to the discourse that we are having new economic blocks from the Global South, thinking of partnerships, thinking of, uh, of a new financial architecture, new trade architecture, and it's a welcome development, but I haven't seen enough coherence and comprehensive approach other than we're gonna create an alternative to the US dominated or Western dominated system. So it's a movement in the right direction, but I haven't seen the coherence yet. For example, this idea that a currency will be backed by gold or backed by, by oil, none of this will actually work. I mean, currencies don't dominate because they're based on gold or the gold standard failed miserably and we, we should not go to that. So moving away from the dollar to base the currency on gold or on, on oil or, or anything else is not the right theoretical framework, policy framework. But I'm all in favor of you know, giving up almost on this idea that we will reform the IMF, we will reform the World Bank to, because the U.S. is not going to give up its veto power. I'm more in favor of building a parallel trade, finance, investment architecture with a coherent development strategy, which is not there yet, but we can get there. And then once you create that, you force the existing financial architecture either to change from within or to become obsolete and disappear. And that is the, the burden of proof is on us and the Global South mm. to have these conversations, to rethink our approach to development, to think of high value added industrial policies from within the Global South, because we have all the natural resources, we have the human capabilities, and we have the market size at scale, which is what you need for industrialization. We may lack maybe the sophisticated manufacturing technology, then what you do is say, we have a vision, we have a strategy, we have the resources, we're looking for partners. And like Mia Motley says, the Prime Minister of Barbados, friends of all, satellites of none. We can partner with China, we can partner with Japan, with the US, with Germany, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And then once you get to that point, and those partners say, no, 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 we're not interested in partnering on this particular vision that you have, we have a different vision, then you truly know who's your partner and who's not. Mm. And that's, a, I think, a great place to leave it, uh, or this very insightful discussion we've had today. Uh, that is all for this edition of Talk Africa. And a big thank you to all of our guests, uh, Dr. Remy Piet, uh, Senior Partner at Emberley Advisory. Of course, Dr. Adu Owusu Sarkodi, joining us there in Ghana, an economics lecturer at the University of Ghana. And of course, Professor Fadel Kaboub joining us here in the studio, President of the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity, and also a professor professor of economics at Denison University. Remember, of course, you can be a part of this conversation online through our social media handles and on Facebook and X, the platform formerly known as Twitter. Now, you can also catch the show on our YouTube uh, playlist. Do keep the conversation going and join us again next week for more Talk Africa. For me, Ucheo Koronkwo, and of course, the team here in Nairobi. Until next time, it is goodbye.